Hello, welcome. Um, this is Olive Hickmott and uh, today is Making Sense of Mental Health and I'm delighted to have with us a, um, an ex-doctor and a, a mind coach now and so this is going to be a different topic for today and so what I'm going to do is just share the um, my screen to you of where we're going to start. That's it. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to do this topic today because um, I've always been confused about the role of mental health and when somebody says they've got poor mental health and what does that actually mean. And so I wanted to get some a view of a doctor who has actually been through the training on mental health. And so uh, that's what we're doing today. And also I'm going to bring up the the sort of how that connects into learning differences. Um, a government health warning I'll just give you for this. If you're triggered by this discussion, please look after yourself, um, which might even be clicking off the video. That's totally with, fine with us. We're live on Facebook as well, so if you see it at a later date, if you don't like what we're saying, then just, then just terminate it. And of course, you're always welcome to come back and talk to us about it. And so here we are. We've got um, my name is Olive Hickmott, and this is Richard Souza. And would you like to introduce yourself, Richard? Yes, I'm a retired GP. Um, I was a GP for 25 years, so I've been through the, the system, and I'm quite used to seeing people who are depressed, anxious, schizophrenic, um, giving them drugs, uh, referring them for counselling referring them to the psychiatric services um, and it's never been a very satisfactory system in the UK partly because the psychiatry is so inaccessible and their answer to everything seems to be to give a drug and people don't seem to get better as much as they would say if they've gone to cardiology or one of the other uh, um, specialities. So I, I saw a, a podcast by a Dr. Amen uh, about three, four months ago, and he was a psychiatrist, but he didn't start off as a psychiatrist. He was a radiographer and he became a psychiatrist and he was stunned that in psychiatry that there seemed to be no tests for, for what they're doing. Um, and so he decided to take pictures of the brain and he began to see that things that were, were being labeled as such and such were maybe down to mineral deficiencies or something else or alcohol. And he was just stunned that they didn't really do any tests. It was all based on a history and a book called the DSM where they said there were a list of conditions. And looking back over 25 years, I think he's right. Um, they seem to have decided how they're going to sort of make a diagnosis or a label and and they've got their own language so it's very hard to challenge it and their usual answer to everything is to give a drug maybe counseling and they haven't come up with the most scientific way of doing it so what do you consider to be poor mental health when you've met it well i think very simply mental health you know we're kind of born with good mental health and when we're in balance we just feel good it's it's that simple it's our it's our feelings and thoughts and and this state can get disrupted and we get get out of balance and then you can see a doctor and then labels are given to it like depression anxiety post-traumatic stress disorder um and then you go down a certain pathway and Dr. Amen came up with a, uh, a neat way of, of looking at mental health, I think. Um, Before you go on to that, can I just say about the DSM? He, mm. I, I was listening to him earlier today and I was stunned by the, one, of the, one of his statements was that with the DSM, 100% of the diagnosis are right because it means that you've looked at all these um, behaviours and they match to what the 
condition is and you can get reliability. But actually, what they're not looking at doing is what's behind those. And I seem to spend my life asking people what's behind them. Why are people doing these? Yeah, they're not getting to the root of things. You know, they've managed to classify every condition into a bunch of behaviours. And it's like a tick box. And if you've got four or five, then you say somebody's got this. But that's not very scientific, is it? And um, if, you had a, if you had a heart problem, you would go for a series of tests. Yeah. It wouldn't be based on, yeah, you're a bit out of breath and you can't walk 10 yards and you've got a slight chest pain. So we'll call that an MI. Yeah. That's very scientific. There has to be more of a test behind it. And there isn't much of a test behind psychiatry. It's the list of things. Uh, if you fit that, then people plump for that diagnosis. And if it's that diagnosis, then there are a bunch of drugs that go with that. And the rest of it isn't done in that way. Okay, so let's talk about the, um, the, the model you were mentioning earlier. Yeah, he came up with these four circles of life. He, he was uh, at medical school, and uh, at the beginning, one of his professors told him this years and years, decades ago. And uh, before, if, if we say everybody is in a balanced state as far as their mental health is concerned, something happens to change that. There's an event or an experience. So if we go to the first circle, it, it could be your environment. It could be your parents. It could be um, you have a bad experience. It could be the people you're working with that get, get you really stressed and depressed. That leads on to how you're thinking and feeling about it. And you could get into this state of mind where you're permanently feeling low and having very negative thoughts. And suddenly this, this balance is beginning to shift. You know, you've got two of the circles have gone red on you, which is a big problem. Because normally we're looking for the four circles to be in a state of green, let's say. And then uh, that can have physical effects on your body brain in that if you get very low it, with your thoughts and your feelings, you could start drinking a lot. And that's going to have an effect on your body and your decision making. And then the last circle, top right, um, you may lose sight of your purpose if you ever find it. So once these circles are kind of affected, then you are in trouble. The top right circle can, can be a physiological thing. You can measure it with, you could have mercury poisoning, that could affect you. Um, you could have a, a low sodium, that could affect you. That could affect the bottom circle on the right. In, in that it could change the flavor of your thoughts and feelings. Um, and I think you need to define what's the difference between a thought and a feeling because I never learned it for years and years. A thought is a string of words like, I'm never going to get better. Um, this is horrible. Um, a feeling is a one word thing like sadness, depression, uh, happiness, deflated, excited, um, inspired. And CBT is very good at dealing with thoughts and feelings. And your environment is, is a really powerful thing because, you know, you could, do, you could do everything right to help somebody, but if they are in a toxic environment, then um, you won't make a lot of progress or the progress will be very slow. So I think those three circles are, are really important. Um, and when you meet a patient, if you start lo looking, if you listen to, if you take the history, and you start seeing where are they in terms of these four circles, you will start to piece together the things that are not quite working as, as well as they could, so they're not in balance. And if you could make a difference to, to whichever circles aren't working, then you can get a change in how they feel from being very negative to more positive. And I think you've missed out purpose in that one. Yeah, I don't think in our world many people do find their purpose, but if you do find your purpose, um, that takes you to a very high place, really, because you, you, you know what you're doing, and, uh, and that, can, that can be a big safeguard 
in terms of uh, dealing with uh, life's problems because life is full of problems isn't it uh, I think if you're clear about what you want to do then and it does take time to do that and a lot of effort um, if you're clear about where you're heading it's a lot easier to fit some of the other things into it okay yeah. so how about recreating balance in our mental health how do we go about doing that well all of these circles will have effects and uh, I think just like in dyslexia you want to burn you you want to you want some tools that can negate the effects um, I think the first thing you do is you, you listen and take a really good history and try and find out what's going on because that can have a, a big effect uh, that can make people feel better um, but if they're feeling uh, very upset and anxious and the thoughts are very powerful uh, it's nice to be able to bring in tools that would help and usually it's drugs but it doesn't have to be drugs it could be techniques like grounding tapping can be quite powerful uh, breathing in yoga can be quite powerful mindfulness mindfulness um, CBT can be very powerful because then you start to get people to see what their thoughts are and that they're not black and white or that they're catastrophizing. And if you can help them to change that, then you get But if they have something, you know, if you've got domestic violence, none of these things are gonna work very well. The environment doesn't change. You're trying to recreate balance, I think, in these four, especially three of them. Mm -hmm. And if you can if you can shift to a step to a place of balance with these tools, which are not necessarily drugs, um, then I think you you could have some really good results. But the medical model in psychiatry uh, tends to be give a drug, which doesn't always work and has side effects. Okay. Shall we just give us an example, as, um, as I'm here, as it were, the, the mental health and learning differences that I started getting involved in last, last, last year, a year ago, two years ago, something like that. I started being asked to go and talk at mental health conferences, and I was a bit confused, to be quite honest, because I'd always thought of mental health as being schizophrenia or something like that, and I thought, whoa, I don't know anything about that. But what I did know about was a lot of anxiety that children who were um, struggling with literacy, numeracy, ADHD, autism, or whatever, were experiencing. And so I got convinced by a friend of mine to go along. She said, it'll be fine. Go along and talk about what you know about. And so I went along, and I drew this picture. And the, um, I, I made it on a big board thing with a picture of a person in the middle and I and what the the format was that I did a talk but then people would come along and look at my my stall and so I had a, on a big piece of um, metallic uh, thing with magnets on it I had a picture in the middle I had exactly this picture a picture in the middle and down one side was poor literacy poor numeracy poor concentration sensory overload and down the other side was the things that um, people were talking about on the same day with on the subject of mental health and so I said to I was started to talk to these kids who were uh, they were doing it as their um, as their project as it were um, in school and I started saying to them well okay is anybody anxious and so you know one kid put hand up yet yeah, said well, I'm really anxious and I said why are you anxious and he looked at me and he went I have no idea I'm just anxious all the time I said How's your literacy? How can you spell and can you read? And he went, oh, I can read. I can't spell anything. It's, and this is year seven in secondary school. So these are 11 year olds. He said, I really can't spell. And I'm continuously got red marks all over my work, etc., etc." So I said, if we could wave the magic wand over your literacy, what would that do to your anxiety? And he just looked at me and stunned and he went, it'd go away. And I went, okay. So and then I talked to him about concentration. And the same thing happened. 
And the, the items on the right hand side of that picture, so my right hand side, I don't know if it's yours, um, started to just disappear if he got some of these basic skills. And so um, that was interesting, interesting day. Met loads of kids who would say exactly the same thing. And um, I started teaching them how to do literacy the easy way for visual learners. The result of that was really that I realized that um, if we're working with literacy, numeracy, concentration, sensory overload, whatever it is, we are also working with the mental health challenges on the right. And then the next stage happens that really concerns me is those are what I would call the sort of first level of mental health challenges. And this is why I need Richard to come in and go, what happens if you do that for long enough? What happens to you? As, what's the progression like when, into adulthood? Um, if you're sort of being anxious, stressed and um, you're not a good learner and you're falling behind and people are labeling you stupid or, or you're labeling yourself as stupid, um, you, you, you don't progress really. Um, and I, I think you can get depressed. Uh, it can affect your life opportunities. Um, in severe cases, it could, deal, it could lead to suicidal thoughts. It could lead to schizophrenia. Um, it's, it's quite big over a period of time. You're talking about 5, 10, 15 years. Well, it can even be shorter than that as well. I spoke to a yeah. woman the other day whose child is so confused going back into school at the moment. She said he laid down in the road and said, I just want to be run over. Yeah, probably because they've been watching the TV a lot, which hasn't helped really. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the, the problem is in the school, uh, the teachers aren't, you know, if, if the child has been said to have dyslexia, they're not actually coming up with the right diagnosis or the right way of sort of getting that better. And all the child is left is feeling um, stressed out and p performing poorly in the classroom and, and losing self-confidence and self-esteem. And that is quite, quite a, a toxic thing day after day, week after week, year after year and they've got exams and these exams are important they've been told and your whole life depends on them uh, which it doesn't um, and they, they, they start to label themselves self-label themselves as failures and that has a massive effect because once that thought gets into your head you've got those feelings uh, very negative feelings of feeling a failure you get some really bad chemicals swimming around in your body and then that starts to have effects all over the place. And you've, you, 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 that's when you really lose a purpose as to, as also yeah. as to what am I going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to be stuck. I'll, I'll never get any qualifications. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to succeed in life. I, I won't have any money. Um, and it depends on the role models you've got around you. Cause if you, if you see that's happened to your parents, um, that can, make you feel very um, disillusioned and, yeah. and you can lose all hope really and helpless. Um, and then you can start getting into other things like drugs, alcohol, gangs. Um, and then that takes you to meet people who, who aren't, who aren't good for you. Um, and then all of a sudden you've got a real social problem. Yeah. The society. I remember when I was um, when I was coming up through the system, and I str really struggled with literacy. And um, they, I guess they tried most things on me, but nothing had worked. And then I um, stumbled over um, the way that people, creative people, are meant to be spelling and reading, and I couldn't believe that I hadn't been told about it. But then I found the neuroscience that supported it. And I'm going, well, okay, so we've got the neuroscience that supports the way we teach at Empowering Learning. But the, the way they're being taught in school at the moment is not supported by the neuroscience because they are not moving on to word recognition. 
and that's the as far as i'm concerned the major problem so okay thank you very much for that richard um i'll just go on to my last slide which if you've read the elephants in the classroom you'll have seen this before and this very much is and i published this when did i publish this last year i think and this is very mapped into those four circles which has been talking about and uh, before I'd seen the four circles. So we've got one over here which is all about safety and behavior and anxiety and fear and trauma. So that's what's going on in your body and what you're doing with breathing. Um, I go into discovering their strengths because once we've discovered their strengths we can work out how to teach them the things they're struggling with. Um, being in your body, I mean, that's a that's a really interesting topic for the one you were talking about earlier, Richard, of what's going on in your body. Actually, if you're not in your body, you're not going to know, and your system isn't going to know. Um, and then controlling mental imagery so that they um, so that they're under control, and then using those skills for academic work like literacy and numeracy. So thank you very much for that. And thank you, Richard, for joining us. And I'm going to close the um, Facebook Live now. And then we'll carry on talking to you.